two and one. Welcome to the city council meeting of June 2nd, 2022. City clerk, could we have a preamble please? This meeting is compliant with the Ralph, Ralph M. Brown Act as amended by California Assembly Bill number 361, effective September 16th, 2021, providing for a public health emergency exception to the standard teleconference rules required by the Brown Act. The purpose of this is to provide a safe environment for the public staff and council members while allowing for public participation. The public may address the council using exclusively remote public comment options. The council may take action on any item listed in the agenda. Members of the public may view the city council meeting by logging into the Zoom webinar. City council meetings can also be viewed live and or on demand via the city's YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash Brisbane CA or on Comcast channel 27. Archive videos can be replayed on the city's website, brisbaneca.org forward slash meetings. The city council meeting will be an exclusively virtual meeting. The agenda materials may be viewed online at brisbaneca.org at least 24 hours prior to a special meeting at least 72 hours prior to a regular meeting. Meeting participants are encouraged to submit public comments in writing in advance of the meeting. Aside from commenting while in the Zoom webinar, the following email and text line will also be monitored during the meeting. Public comments received will be noted for the record during oral communications one and two or during an item. Email ipadia at brisbaneca.org, text 628-219-2922. Join the Zoom webinar with a webinar ID 991. 9362-8666 and the passcode 123456 and the call in number 1669-900-9128. If you need special assistance to participate in this meeting, please contact me, the city clerk at 415-508-2113. Notification in advance of the meeting will enable the city to make reasonable arrangements to ensure accessibility to this meeting. Thank you. Thank you, City Clerk. Meeting is called to order at 7.34 p.m. Would you please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Could we have a roll call, please? Council Member Cunningham. Here. Council Member Davis. Here. Council Member Lentz. Here. Councilmember O'Connell is absent and Mayor Mackin. Here, thank you. Uh, City Attorney, could we have a report out of closed session, please? Yes, Madam Mayor. Uh, item D uh, we, was just an update for the council this uh, this uh, meeting, and item E we had direction, we uh, received direction from the council. Thank you. Thank you move on to the adoption of the agenda. Could I get a first and second to approve the agenda as it stands, please? So moved. And a second? Aye. Roll call, please. Council Member Cunningham? Aye. Council Member Davis? Aye. Council Member Lentz? Aye. Council Member O'Connell is absent and Mayor Mackey? Aye. Moving on to awards and presentations. This is June 2022. We have a proclamation for Pride Month that I'll read. Whereas the city of Brisbane embraces our diversity, that we are a community of all races, creeds and backgrounds, and the pursuit of equality, respect and inclusion for all is our goal. Whereas no one should be subjected to any type of bigotry, harassment, discrimination or violence, because of who they are or due to sexual orientation or gender identity, whereas it is essential to acknowledge that education remains vital to end discrimination, biases, and prejudice, acceptance is something we must all practice and teach to future generations. Whereas celebrating Pride Month provides support and advocacy for San Mateo County's LGBTQ community, it is also an opportunity to engage in dialogue, to build understanding and advance equal rights. Whereas acknowledging our nation was founded on the principle that every individual has infinite dignity and worth. No one should live in fear or face persecution. We call upon the people of Brisbane to embrace this principle 
work to eliminate prejudice wherever it exists and foster a warm and hospitable place for all to live. Now, therefore, as mayor of Brisbane, I hereby proclaim the month of June 2022 as Pride Month in support and recognition of our LGBTQ residents who make Brisbane a vibrant community in which to live. And I believe we have San Mateo County Commissioner Craig Weisner attending city clerk. Ah, there's Craig. Okay. Craig is on the San Mateo County LGBTQ Commission. Craig, would you like to say a couple words? Yes, thank you. Uh, good evening. As you said, I'm County Commissioner Craig Wiesner. My husband and I have been Brisbane's neighbors for 30 years. We feel blessed to live in a place where God's wild diversity is celebrated with a true sense of belonging, wide open arms, and progress, symbolized by the rainbow flag that Brisbane flies all year long. And where last year Deanna Washington was inspired to create her Love is Love artwork. In other states right now, teachers are being fired for displaying symbols like this one. Rainbow stickers are being scraped off doors and walls of schools. Books like this one, featuring babies of all shapes, colors, and sizes have actually been banned. Imagine this book about astronaut Sally Ride being banned from classrooms. You don't have to imagine, it is. The people of Brisbane, by flying the pride flag all year round, and through this city council proclaiming Pride Month in June, are sending a very different message. Love is love, and love will always win. So on behalf of the San Mateo County LGBTQ Commission, I thank you for celebrating diversity and love, and thank you, Brisbane, for keeping the stars brightly lit for us all. Thank you. Thank you, Craig. Our pleasure, Mr. Weisner, and thank you for your, your service on the commission as well. Thank you so much. Thank you. We move on to oral communications. Uh, City Clerk, do we have any member of the public wishing to make a public comment? This would have to be an item that's not on our agenda tonight. Madam Mayor, I see no hands raised of those in attendance. And have not received any written correspondence or um, text messages. All right, thank you. We move on to the consent calendar. Can I get a first and second to approve the consent calendar? That's items B through F. So moved. Second. Second. And could we have a roll call, please? Council Member Cunningham. Aye. Council Member Davis. Aye. Council Member Lentz. Aye. Member um, O'Connell is absent and Mayor Mackey. Aye. Moving to new business. Tonight we have an item G consider adoption of a resolution revising the conflict of interest code to include the complete street safety committee, open space and ecology committee, public arts advisory committee, and the communication manager. Staff report, please. Yes, Madam Mayor, I think I'm uh, handling this one this evening. The state's Political Reform Act requires that the council adopt the Conflict of Interest Code and that it review it uh, biannually every two years. As part of the um, adoption of the code under the Reform Act, there are designations of who must be subject to this, uh, the city's Conflict of Interest Code. Um, that includes folks like the city managers, the city attorney, other public officials such as yourselves, um, as well as planning commission. In addition to the planning commission, outside of the uh, express language of the act, the city has the discretion to determine who else has decision-making authority within a certain context and uh, to determine whether or not they too should be subject to the city's conflict of interest code. Currently, the city council uh, has adopted a code that exclude, includes the planning commission and includes the parks and recreation commission within the code expressed. Again, the planning commission's mandatory under state law, uh, the park and recreation commission is a decision the council made. In recent months, questions have come up about uh, the appearance of conflicts and whether there was a way to tighten things uh, 
uh, in that regard for the city and how would the city go about it. Um, these have been sort of informal. I believe they've been discussed in at least one council uh, meeting. What came up um, during those discussions was the fact that there would be a review of the conflict of interest code that the city adopted. This is the usual biannual review. And at that time, there was nothing that prevented the council from adding other commissioners or commission members to uh, be subject to the code expressed. The city, uh, in my time with it, has said rather clearly that they want everybody to act as though uh, they are subject to it, but the law doesn't require it. If the council chooses to extend the code to other commissions, uh, then the council is extending the law to it. It's not just a, we'd like you to follow it, it's you are mandated. And in that regard, as we reviewed, what commissions uh, appear to have decision-making authority or very close to it under state law, uh, we came up with the commissions identified and that's what we're bringing before you. Those commissions uh, do appear to have the decision-making authority, it's a close call, but if they do in fact have decision-making authority, then we recommend that the council have them be expressly covered by the Thank you. Uh, council member questions. Council member Lentz, you want to start? I don't have any questions. Okay. Council member Cunningham. Thank you. I, I sent a, um, a question in earlier to play, but unfortunately I was out and I don't know whether he had time to respond. If you look at, um, Item G, page 99, paragraph 7, line 6. I'll give you guys a second to get there because I was a little confused. Um, and line 6, it says additional source separating and then goes on to line 7. Tom, can you explain to me what that means or was I just being absent-minded when I was trying to understand that? Wait, what package? What pa what page is this in the packet? Page page ninety nine, in item G, it's paragraph seven, line six. It's it it goes on to say various things, and then it says additional source separating, and then goes on to line seven. I didn't understand what that meant. I can respond to that. Oh, thanks, Clay. Yeah. So it was just providing an example of where there might be a decision that would have an economic impact on the um, on this in this case a, a, a let's say a company like Wacology or South San Francisco Scavengers. So source as you know we all source separate certain things. If we were if the Open Space Committee made a recommendation to so, uh, source separate you know let's say an additional three or four things those could that could have an impact on the uh um, the finances of the uh, company that was um you know being affected by it so it was just an example of where where something like that might come up yeah i, I had just never heard that term that term yeah <laughs> operating and i'm like what yeah is it's, a, it's a term of art in the uh recycling world thank you council member davis can i just get clarity um so it said that the city, it talks about filing form 700s and then that we have already two commissions that are subject to the act. Are our park and rec commission and planning commission filing form 700s currently? Unless they're exempt, they should be, yes. And I believe when did that real. start? I believe they all are filing. Is that right, Ingrid? I, I don't think the planning commission is by law through the 87, the 87 200 filers along with city council members and then the Park and Rec Commission, we started that through a resolution approved by the council in 2017. Okay, yeah, because I never had to file one when I was I when I was on there. So um, okay. I'm just wondering if I okay, this is actually a comment, so I'm gonna be quiet. Okay. I actually was gonna ask the same question as Council Member Davis. So Thank you for that clarity. Do um, you have any public comments, City Clerk? Any members of the public? I do. I received a comment from Patrick Tainter, current um, committee member for Complete Streets. Um, he 
wanted to relate to the city council that many of our projects are citywide in nature. Expansion of the conflict of interest code to CSC has the potential to render us unable to perform our role of evaluating issues and making recommendations to council. Considering these matters, I would ask council to carefully craft the conflict of interest code as it would apply to the complete streets committee so that we can continue to perform the work council has appointed to us. Okay. Do we have any other members of the public wishing to comment? Um, I do not see any raised hands, Madam Mayor, and I have not received any additional correspondence. Okay, so we'll move to council discussion. Uh, Councilmember Cunningham, you want to start? Sure. So, for continuity and complete transparency, I mean, I think the examples that were given in our packet are really relevant. And I've seen a couple of situations, and I won't mention the names of the committees, that I could see moving forward, we could have a conflict. And, you know, you know, here, here's my bailiwick. Here's the thing that I'm really passionate about. And I'm going to get my group of people to lobby this committee or this commission to do X, Y, and Z. So I think to make it seamless from my perspective, I would say, let's just make everybody do it. And so we're taking the special interest thought press process out of the game. Is that clear, you guys? Mm -hmm. um, Cliff, is that clear what I'm saying? It, it does, and yeah, I mean, I think the recommendation is is sound. So uh, I'd be uh, in favor of moving forward with it. Thank you. I, I thought I would be, because it's just like, why not? But I really feel like Form 700 is like such a pain in the ass for <laughs> us. And it's like, I mean, it's right at tax season and it's like, it's work to do it. And, um, you know, I get that planning commission has to do it. It's a commission and park and rec you know, we decided they need to do it in 2017, but I think like we have a hard time enough keeping people on the rest of our committees. We have a hard time, I think, keeping our other committees full. I just feel like this is like another layer of work that I could see like it could make people not not want to continue on because every single year they're essentially having to do like this form um and making it public all of their finances like I don't under I mean I don't really understand what you're saying Karen to be honest because people could have their group of friends come and support anything and that doesn't say yes or no and get all your people to show up at a meeting and that has nothing to do with like your stocks and bonds and your who who you're employed with or anything. So, and I just don't think those other those other bodies aren't aren't making decisions that aren't ultimately run through us, which you know, this is our job, right? We're we're paid, we're paid a measly amount, but this like it, it is expected of us to fill out form 700 and that's what comes to roll. I think this is an unnecessary, an unnecessary layer, and I haven't seen it be. Has there ever been an issue where there's been a conflict because of someone's employer in the past, and somebody still wanted to vote on something? I just, I don't know. Situationally, this has actually been proven to be needed. It's come up a few times over the years. I mean, mostly and at the council level. Refused? At what level? Yeah, at, at the council level, uh, it's well, come I up. Mean, yeah, and, and it, it, you do have to refuse. I, I, I don't know, like Tom. I mean, my understanding is whether or not we require people to put, fill out the form seven hundred by putting them under our conflict ordinance, they're still subject to FEPC complaints and could be in jeopardy through that process. So. I mean, it's not something we have unilateral ability to exclude somebody from. Being under the, being formally under the conflicts code would give an added credibility to a complaint because the FPPC is not going to 
get in the business of uh, reacting. It, it has enough uh, on its plate to react to without reacting to an advisory committee having about a minor matter, something that involves no money and is an appearance issue type of thing. Can they do that? Yeah. And depending on the commission uh, over the years, the makeup of the commission, they have. I don't think they've done it at the local government level. They, they've definitely done it. Um, to, to your other point, uh, Clay, no, I do. Do I think it's a particular added burden? Um, no, what, what comes to mind for me, uh, which I was not aware of until I, it came up sometime during the pandemic, is there was a commissioner who who just flat out said, it doesn't apply to me, I'm not gonna refuse and I'm not gonna uh, make it look like I'm guilty. Now that person changed their mind, but you do, you do get that kind of reaction where the person's reaction wasn't, what's the appearance for the city? The person's reaction was, well, this makes me look guilty. And so I'm not gonna refuse. Um, I've seen that throughout my career. I've seen it only a few times in Brisbane and I've never seen it before. Uh, the council's always been, the council's I've worked with always been never too well. In, in fact, you recruit yourself sometimes when you're not required to stop because mm -hmm. I just feel like we have enough witch, witch hunts that go on at the council level. I mean, how many times have we had FPBC things filed that were just totally, totally like absurd? And do I think that like to open us up to have our committee members be subject to like that possibility? I just, you know, like if somebody is not performing the way that we want them to, we just don't reappoint. So, so I just, I don't know. I, I wanna clarify one thing in case I may have caused confusion, I apologize. Clay, if that was your point, I, I understood it differently. Madison, um, yeah, PPC letters will go in regardless, if that was your point, Clay. Um, my point was how much credence they'll be given. Uh, I misunderstood what Clay was getting, but yes, they, the FPPC, I don't even know the number, but the number of folks who perceive a conflict and send letters off across the state is an astounding the ease with which we accuse each other of crimes is always astounding. So if I can weigh in, I've looked at both sides of this and I've gone back and forth on it. Because in many ways, it seems innocuous on the surface. The concern I have is in trying to think of other examples other than what was in this, this report. And I could see instances where someone feasibly could be perceived to be someone who should be recused. And Who's going to decide that? And then also, what is their interest in a particular topic? Is it because they own property? Is it because of their profession? Is it because of their employer? Is it because of whatever? But if genuinely their concern, no matter what committee, is public safety, Shouldn't they be allowed to weigh in on something that might entail public safety? But if they're asked to recuse themselves, A, who's asking them to do that? Is it a chair? Is it, is it just done by their own admission? And could that be splitting hairs where we're asking people to decide within a committee where someone might disagree with why they're being asked to be recused without very clear definitions? The second part of my concern on this, we have uh, recently done some recruiting to add to committees and we have small numbers of respondents. We're a small city and sometimes it takes a couple years before you get another wave of applicants. We have a complete streets committee right now that has four members. Two of them live close by each other. So if they have to recruit, uh, recuse themselves geographically, 
act quickly because of where they live, then that committee could effectively be working on a project with two members only. And and they struggle with a quorum, that committee historically, and if it had seven members. That yeah. committee also has somebody who has a business on Bayshore. Will you say like they can't work on anything be because Bayshore- And geographically, we're a small city. Right, so if we said, well, within 500 feet of something, Central Brisbane is a small area, or if you consider the ridge. So that's my concern. I don't know what we do with that. But because of safety issues, that's that's where I think we have to think this through. Council Member Davis? Um, and I think the other thing is like committees aren't commissions. Like we, we, there, they, there should be some delineation between a commission and a committee. And I think commissions, you know, they, their voting power is a little bit different, but I mean, I think that, I don't know that we should expect them all to exact, to behave exactly the same when there is a difference between a committee and a commission. So should they all be held to the same standard? when one is definitely like it's it's a more intense possibly a workload and it's paid and um you know the the decisions are maybe have carry a little bit more they don't necessarily always go through council so i don't know i think this one's a little, I don't think this was as clear cut as it seems. City attorney, do we have a, a way to distinguish between commissions and committees that we should be considering? Yeah, and you, you've you've mostly done it. I, I've I've heard three, possibly four questions. Um, so on that question, uh, different cities do it different ways. The way you've done it is commission slash committee. Um, a commission is generally invested with more authority. That doesn't mean they have the level of authority that triggers the state um, conflict of interest uh, requirements of the Brown Act, but it gets closer to it, whereas a committee is, is sometimes more uh, informally advisory. They look into something, they have a, the people involved have a particular interest in that area, and they, they want to weigh in. Um, for this city, commissions are uh, are treated as best I can tell. The, the commissions are treated as having greater authority, both in the ordinances and in the way the council reacts uh, to them. And the committees are mainly advisory, which means that the whether an advisory committee has decision making authority, that's the legal standard for triggering a conflict of interest vote. Whether they have a decision-making authority, they probably don't. Uh, and that's that's what I concluded, that's what uh, Michael concluded. Where it got close was something like public arts where there was money being spent at the recommendation committee and it was significant money. So it's really decision-making authority. It's not the title, commission versus committee. But in this city, you do make a pretty strong uh, difference between commission and committee. The second point is much easier. Who decides if there's a conflict? The law decides and the, and the conflict of interest code decides. That is perhaps the single greatest challenge. Uh, Brisbane doesn't see it uh, very often, but we certainly see it elsewhere all the time where an individual says, I don't interpret it as a conflict and therefore I will not recuse myself. And they don't realize two factors, no matter, and frequently, no matter how many times you explain it, they're putting themselves in jeopardy because the law is at their expense in that instance. If, they, if they're gonna insist on participating in a vote that they have a conflict on, there's a thing under the law called a common interest conflict, uh, uh, a common interest conflict, which is you can be prosecuted, not just by the FPBC. Is it likely? No, but if you refuse to recuse, you're putting yourself in jeopardy. Uh, but the other party they're putting in jeopardy goes to, 
what um, council member Ma uh, Davis said, which is you're opening yourself up to perceptions of conflict, sometimes actual conflicts that are reported to the FPPC, and then we can't resolve. We have to wait for them to send the letter two years, three years, four years later, depending on the work, saying, we don't think there was a conflict or we think it was so. There's and you think. So the law determines if there's a conflict. I want to be very clear on that. Who enforces? The FPPC enforces unless somebody really acts in their own self-interest such that they trigger that common uh, common law exception uh, where somebody else can sue for a problem. But that, that's going to be pretty interesting. So think of it as the FPPC. The district attorney can enforce. Occasionally, a city attorney can enforce in very limited circumstances. But think of it as the FPPC. Um, as far as uh, property interest versus uh, financial interest, Form 700 gets a financial interest. Mm -hmm. What is the range of interest you have in this category? Is it uh, zero to 50,000? Is it 50 to 100? Uh, that's as much to get people thinking about where conflicts might arise as it is actually telling the world, oh, look for a conflict. That's what Form 700 is. Property is, that, that's a different equation than Form 700. That's geography. And you've chosen as a city, hey, if they're within X feet, then we're going to ask people to look you because it appears to be uh, a conflict of interest potentially, or it might appear to be a conflict. You have discretion there. But geography versus ownership of stocks and bonds and what's in the bank, those are very different things. The stocks and bonds things are Form 700. The geography is your local interpretation and how you want to put it into your ordinance and how you want it. Hmm. Councilmember Cunningham? What if? What if, and I understand your points, Madison, and I agree. What if we kind of table this for now, but put a memo of some description out to our committees? Because I do have some concerns that people are there for their own benefit at the end of the day. Um, what if we put a memo out that describes you know, you might be on X committee, but if there's something, you know, that's happening on your street or something within your purview relative to public art or whatever else it might be, that it would behoove you not to be part of the conversation or to, some, do you know where I'm going, Tom? Am I making Yeah, and, and we, um, when you were uh, mayor, um, we, we send a memo like that around. Uh, it was pretty informal. You asked that a, a more uh, in-depth memo go, and we drafted the first part of the year, and I March or April under America uh, Hacken. But yeah. Ingrid, do you know when that? Yeah, happened? that went out in March. March. Yeah. I, I, mean, I mean, that stuff is really good, but I think just enforcing in the minds of people who, hey, I'm really interested in complete streets because I want my street improved, you know, that, that we need to enforce that particular thought process. And hey, I'm on public art because I've got all of these resources and I would love to have my friend be one of the, um, the people making the decision about who's our consultants and whatever. I think if that's the case, people need to say, you know, you know, not come in and say, this person's great, but say, I have a friend and therefore, I don't know if you guys want to recommend them or not, because I, I've seen that in both cases. And I, and I agree with the report that, yeah, you could get sort of sucked into the whole idea that, you know, I mean, with the dog, with the dog park, for example, I didn't have to recuse myself from voting on who we chose as the second person, but because of optics, I thought it was the smart thing to do. So if we can put that out maybe to the committees and 
hold this this process over and bring it back if um, if we need to. I but think. I don't think that that's like a that situation is not like a recusal. I mean, you did it for optics, and I think a lot of us on the council we do things for optics all the time. Like I recuse myself from so many things I don't have to. But from a from a committee or a commission perspective, like that's like if someone on planning commission, right? They had a friend really their best friend was coming with an application they still wouldn't have to recuse even though they they abide by even though they abide by that standard now they still wouldn't have to so i don't even know well but if we put it out as you know here's some examples of things that could come up and for optical reasons or just for practical reasons you know think hard and fast about whether you should be doing things whether they're legal or not well, I'd like to bring up the safety again, because Council Member Cunningham, you brought up um, someone could be dealing with um, improvement of their street. If you were very concerned that all the residents on your street would have difficulty evacuating in an emergency situation, mm -hmm. is that to your benefit or is that public safety where you're being responsible as a member of a committee that could take into account those criteria that's where i kind of there's a gray area there when you start talking about about public safety you have valuable insight valuable insight i want to be very clear here having an interest in improving the safety of your tree is not a property interest it's not a stock interest it's not a conflict um the you know, where where somebody will perceive a conflict is if you don't acknowledge during the discussion, and, you know, I live on that street and I see the people driving the um, That is not a legal conflict of interest. Um, having a focus during a committee discussion on your particular street because there's a legitimate problem. Where a conflict would arise would be over time. If, if uh, Colleen Mackin kept bringing up only her street. And every time the money came up, there were three streets going to be picked, and somehow Colleen Street was always one of the ones being picked. That's where you get common law conflicts of interest that people will try to go after. But I want to stress again, it's very rare, and it's very hard to prove. That's why I focus everybody on the FPPC, because that's the real enforcer. And they're not looking at things like, is the person a good public servant? And they happen to live on the street. They're looking is, did that person vote for something that improved the value of? Did that person vote for something because it meant that their their property value just went up five hundred thousand dollars because of something being resolved in their backyard? That's the kind of thing the FTPC will, and that's what Form Seven Hundred is the is to get that information out there so people can track. Well, Public and one, safety is not a conflict. One other, one other concern I have on this is you could have a situation with a, a committee where there's a perception that several people have an agreement about a direction to go in. And if one person is perceived as going a different direction, that they could be called on oh you need to recuse yourself because you are either employed your main source of income you own this property and 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 my concern is then that committees will be imposing the judgment on who has to recuse themselves and, and it might not be appropriate in some it, cases it is not a whether you, the council tables this or decides not to do this, no skin in the game. This is a judgment call for the council. Um, it is not a committee's decision whether or not they're a member of the mm -hmm. If they should or people think they should, they should ask them to. But they don't get to say if, if um, Cliff says, yeah, I hear you, but you don't know all the facts. I'm not going to recuse myself. They don't get to say Cliff's out of the realm. He doesn't get to vote on it. That's not their call. 
It's your call, right? It could become my call, but hopefully it never gets. Um, and I will tell you that I can think of only three instances where this has come up below the council. And in one instance, the person, once they were aware of the issue, they went further than them. They were afraid of her parents and stuff now. This is a, right after I became the attorney. Um, and I understood why. Uh, but the other two instances, the people didn't hesitate at all. Once they understood the issue, they accused themselves. So it is about education, but but nobody should believe that that they, as the chair, get to say you don't get to vote uh, because they're the commission chair, the committee chair, or I think you've got a conflict. You don't get to vote if they feel that strongly. Mm -hmm. That person needs to table the vote and call the city. So, Councilmember Lentz, we haven't heard from you on this. You know, I mean, uh, to me, it, it, it my 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 thing is that we should have consistency. Um, I've heard the, you know, the various, you know, positions. I remember when I was appointed to the planning commission, I was not the first uh, choice from the council. Uh, a member of OSEC was the first choice. The reason I was appointed was because that person did not want to provide her financial information. So, you know, OSEC, she didn't have to do it. She could stay. So, um, you know, I, so kind of hearing your, your, your point, you know, Madison, you know, just having that additional layer, you know, can feel like a burden and people, you know, also don't want to provide you know, I guess what they consider sensitive information, right? Um, not that it's, you know, I guess, I mean, I guess there's a certain level of, of uh, being able to, to keep that. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't think it's, it's all out there in the general public, but, you know, people could request, you know, um, information about someone in regards to the time. So, yeah, so that, that kept that person from, from not wanting to be a planning commissioner. Um, again, you know, we do have these other commissions that have these rules. And to me, it's, yeah, it's a little bit of a burden, but I, I, I lean towards consistency. So it seems we have two directions to go on this. Council member Cunningham suggested a memo, memo to committees and holding off on this for now. The other would be to go ahead with the resolution. What is council's pleasure? Council member Davis. I mean, I'm happy to vote. Has a motion been made? Just want to be no, we have no motion on the table. If someone wants to make a motion, we can entertain a motion. How do I make a motion that we don't vote on what's on the table, but we send a memo out to everybody and check in on the performance within the next six months? And if we see that there's an issue, because I think there is an issue, but I'm willing not to vote on it tonight. I agree with Madison. Um, I would love consistency, but I, I would like to sort of give everybody an opportunity to you know, get a memo from legal and then let's see how the performance goes from everybody. And if we have any issues, we can say, okay, everybody needs to be on the same page. And yes, the form 700's a pain in the butt. And thank you, Ingrid, for all the help. Give me every time I have to fill it in because it is a pain. <laughs> um, but I, I would be happy to, you know, make a motion to send a memo out and make things very clear. It would appear that the memo that went out in May um, uh, has quietened down quite a few people. So if we put it in writing that this is the expected behavior and these are the things that you shouldn't do, um, maybe that will be sufficient. So we have a motion on the table, but we also have a hand up from our city manager, did you want to weigh in before we go for a second? Yeah, and it's probably a, it needs to be kind of a question direct to the city attorney. So, um, it, it, your discussion about your 
boards and commissions, you know, that's that's fine. Um, we do have some staff that we wanted to add to um, this requirement. Um, so um, I guess the city attorney, could the council um, carve that up tonight? We make, or, yeah. do you want us, or do you want us to come back at another time to do that? We uh, have to make it. I'm sorry, um, we do have to make a decision in this in this uh, time frame though before October of 2020. 2020. I will make a motion. I will make a motion for that. I think this is two separate motions. Okay. All right. Thank you. So the first motion from Council Member Cunningham. We have a second on that for a memo. Yeah, I, I, I'm I'm sorry. Can. I apologize if I'm missing something. Um, Council member Davis is asking whether or not, or suggesting that the decision be bifurcated so staff be voted on separately from the commission question. Is that correct? Um, it's not a motion. She's just asking for that clarification. Is that correct, Madison? I just said I would do the motion for staff. Oh, you would do the motion for staff. Okay. Yeah. So, um, Karen, then your motion, if you would just make it clear that, and I guess we're doing that, that it's for the commissions and com uh, committees. committees. Okay. I may, I would make a motion that we send a memo outlining the financial and legal responsibilities or however that gets worded, Tom, to our committees and commissions. Um, to, to lay out the responsibilities relative to voting. Is that clear enough, Tom? It is, it is. Thank you. Thank you. So is there a second on that? Second. Roll call, please. Council Member Cunningham? Aye. Council Member Davis? Aye. Council Member um, Lentz? Aye. And Mayor Mackin. Aye. Then we have a second motion. Council Member Davis, would you like to re enter that motion again for clarity? To revise the city's conflict of interest code to include the community. Include the what? I'm sorry. I think you froze a little bit. Right. Okay, she's back. <laughs> I was everything froze. Say it again. Okay, sorry. I make a motion to revise the city's conflict of interest code to include the communications manager. And a second. Second. And a roll call, please. Councilmember Cunningham. Aye. Councilmember Davis. Aye. Councilmember Lentz. Aye. Councilmember O'Connell is absent. Mayor Mackin. Aye. And motion passes. Moving on to staff reports. City manager, could we have your report, please? Hold that up real quick. So the uh, first item is uh, the Cal Fire hand crews um, helped finish up the field break project uh, behind Trinity and Kings last week. Uh, wildfire, wildfire Awareness Day is on this Saturday from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. at Brisbane Community Park. Uh, we will have uh, North County Fire Authority, Brisbane Police Department, Fire Safe San Mateo County, California Department of Insurance. Uh, we'll all be there and um, providing information and uh, good, good information for people to protect their properties. And finally, uh, Lunafest. Um, is coming up on Saturday, June 11th, um, films by women, about women, and uh, through a partnership with the Brisbane Lions Club, event proceeds will go towards scholarships for young women pursuing degrees in male-dominated fields. Uh, LunaFest is quickly approaching. Um, grab your tickets now at brisbane.org slash LunaFest, and I believe this is a um, an event that's going to be both um, in person as well as available online. Yes. Is that all? 
Yeah, I think the city attorney wanted to just report out real quickly on um, status with high speed rail. Okay, go ahead. I think you're muted. Did we have a report out from closed session? We did. did. Yes. We did. Okay. This, this. Uh, just the, this is just to confirm for the public that we, the city expects that high speed rail authority will make its preference known about uh, whether or not to place a uh, light maintenance facility on the Baylands property. Its first preference is uh, known as the east side option. And that uh, vote is expected to be on the 16th of, uh, of this month. And we have no indication that it will be delayed. Thank you. Move on to Mayor Council Matters and um, committee recruitment update. We had uh, reopened recruitment for Complete Street Safety Committee and the IDEA Committee. Um, I have some notes. City Clerk, did you want to report on this or do you want me to? Sure. Go? Sure, Madam, Madam Mayor. Um, we received one application for the Complete Street Safety Committee. We were recruiting for three seats for terms until 2026. We also received one application um, for the IDEA Committee on time. Um, and then one was submitted three days late. After the deadline, we were recruiting for three seats for one year terms until 2023 for that. Um, I was wondering what was council's pleasure? Should we interview the applicants um, as schedule allows or should we wait until a later, a later time? Uh, City clerk, I think you indicated to me you've got one person submitted an application late. Yes, the um, Ms. Nito submitted her application a few days late. And that, that was, was for that. That was for the idea committee. Okay. So council's pleasure. Um, I would accept that application. Me too. I would too. Council member Lund. I agree. Okay. And interviewing applicants this month. Yes. They've waited long enough. We should give them that respect. Council member Davis. I'm fine with that, although I know we have council members absent. So there is a possibility it would be three of us. I'm okay with that. Okay. And, and I'm okay with it. I'd like to see additional members added to those committees. So, cool. all right. Um, moving on to countywide assignments and subcommittee reports. Council member Lentz, you want to report first? Sure. Um, Madison and I had an affordable housing subcommittee meeting. Uh, we, went, we met with our consultant, Chris, from Eco Northwest. Uh, it was really more of an update on um, putting together uh, the information from, uh, you know, from the feedback that we gave, you know, at uh, the presentation that they gave to the council. Um, you know, looking at uh, really more of, you know, where can we, um, where can we put affordable housing in, in the non Baylands areas of, of Brisbane? Uh, uh, how can we generate uh, additional revenue for affordable housing? Um, I don't know. What, what else uh, did he provide uh, as feedback, Madison? It's mostly it. We just looked at like strategies to promote affordable housing and then also talked about like what strategies we resonated with and what like our priorities were with respect to how we use affordable housing dollars. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, debating whether or not it's, you know, it should it be something that is built or using the funds for uh you know, rent assistance or other um, financial means. Yeah. And then we talked also about, uh, you know, just uh, getting more uh, public input, you know, and having some kind of uh, public engagement. Can I ask what criteria are being used to determine what is affordable? Because the, I believe the median income of San Mateo County is now up to 145,000. 
and there's a whole segment of the county that is not even close to that, which most people, I guess, from what I've read, the perception is middle class is somewhere between 80 and 110,000. And so to see 145,000 is really shocking if you're calling that middle income. So when you've met talking about affordable, can you just elaborate a little what income levels you're working on? Yeah, you know, I don't think you really got, you know, into those types of, of details. Yeah. You know, it's really just more of a 30 foot, you know, perspective. You know, what are the, the you know, what, what makes sense as a location? You know, what Would strategies we, for providing financing? If, if like, that's the direction of the mountain. Would we rather, you know, do rental assistance or first time home buyer program or like actually have a site like the senior center, you know, like this, like the senior housing, like there's a lot of strategies to use affordable housing money. Some of that involves building, some of that doesn't. And so like, what were our priorities with how we spend those dollars? Um, and then I think like, you know, when we determine what strategy we want, that determines the income level, right? So like one Sam Bruno, that was a below market rate unit. And then the, the restrictions were set, like staff knows the staff knows all of the calculations to determine. Um, there's, you know, a very low, like very, very low market rate. Then there's mark, you know, all the different ones have different calculations. And then if we did like a, if we did a project with a, like a nonprofit developer, I guess, then they have like their own, you know, they have their own calculations of what you need, depending on what the mix of units, if it, you know, very, very low income, low income, what the mix in that building is. And that kind of, I think, dep depends on density too, um, because the finances have to balance out with the rents coming in. So I think you have to figure out like what type of project or how you want to spend the money first. And then the calculations are done to determine who qualifies for that. If there was just any way in, in your discussions, I would just, my ask would be that we start keeping more attention in mind for low and very low income, because there's, that's just, that's not been addressed countywide, but especially in Brisbane, it's an area we have RENA allocations. It, it, it would be nice to be able to show that, that we tried to push something for those levels. And that's something that like Cliff and I did talk about, because they asked us, you know, would you rather do like first time home buyer program? And I was like, first time home buyer program? Like that's not even getting at people who can afford to just need a little bit of assistance to get into a home. There's like, you're missing all of those people who really just need like stable rent, who need to pay $800 a month for rent. The thought of even being able to buy a house is so beyond. So I think that like Cliff and I were giving, you know, our thoughts on that was like, how can we prioritize the people who truly need it the most, the people who can't even afford to rent at market rate? How do we keep those people stable? Um, and, I, and but, you know, ultimately all of that would come back, all of that, all of those priorities would come back to this body anyway. Mm -hmm. You know, to get to your point though, Colleen, in regards to, you know, having, uh, units that are truly affordable, right, to those lower income um, people. And that's something we did talk about. In, but, you know, the reality is that, you know, you have to have more volume, mm -hmm. right, so that it pencils out financially. And so then, you know, then we run into that issue with density and how many, how many stories. And granted, we own some properties, and that really helps the financial end of it, but, you know, we run up, you know, against that kind of obstacle of like, well, if it's too tall, too big, then that doesn't fit in with the, you know, the makeup of the town. So then, we, you know, so then we just kind of get stuck. And, and, you know, the whole, I think, goal of hiring Eco Northwest is to help us kind of get out of 
maybe this kind of rut that we keep finding ourselves in and that we do come up with strategies that find that balance. But it, it, it's going to take a, you know, a willingness from, from all parties. It's definitely hard, definitely hard, especially we have, we have service sector employees who might want to live who, who work in Brisbane, but they can't afford it. And yeah, it, it's a tough balancing act. So thank you for your work on that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was it. That was the only one. Okay. Council Member Cunningham? Um, I just wanted to echo um, what Madison and Cliff were talking about with this affordable housing. I, I went to the, <clears throat> excuse me, I swallowed my water down the wrong way and I'm still croaking about it. Um, I went to the Jefferson Union um, opening of the affordable housing <coughs> complex that they built on their site up on Saramonte in the 700 block of Saramonte. And I, I asked the question, how did you guys get this to happen? Because the, the rent for a, don't quote me for sure, but the rent for a three bedroom unit, I think is $2,400. And the rent for a studio anywhere else around us is $2,400. So that was very helpful to families and whatever. And, and I had asked one of the board members of Jefferson Union High School District, um, how did this come about? It came about because for year after year after year, they were losing every year 25% of their teachers, not because the teachers didn't like the job, not because the teachers didn't like the kids or anything else to do with the job, but they couldn't afford to stay anywhere close enough to do the job. I mean, we all know teachers go home at the end of the day and that's not the end of their day. There's how many more hours of grading and, and whatever. So to go to this opening and see how thrilled all of these, and it's not just the teachers, it is anybody employed by the Jefferson Union High School District can apply to one of these um, apartments. And to see how thrilled these people were that somebody had a solution. So, and I know they did it at, um, uh, oh, I've forgotten the name, the, the college, College of San Mateo, they did the same thing. So there are solutions. We've just got to figure out outside of the schools, what is that solution in the public sector or something else like that without, you know, going down the path that, you know, South San Francisco was thinking about with, oh, let's just build all this public housing. But, you know, clearly they're running into a roadblock with that because how do you support it? But obviously they got a bond to do this up at Jefferson Union. And I saw a whole bunch of really happy people and they're they're saying now they're going to be able to keep these people working for them that they love um and they had a solution so that was just an add-on to you guys sorry i didn't mean to take over that concept but <coughs> would you like me to continue with my subcommittees sure okay we didn't get to do it at the last meeting so i'm just going to read them and then tell you uh what i think bayland subcommittee um uh public art um madison and i had public art and if you want to talk about that in a minute uh, i did a jpa for the library the atherton library is opening this saturday and obviously they would love as many people there as they could but the jpa conversation the ccag conversation the um the legislative committee for ccag was all about the bills that are going through uh up in sacramento and um <clears throat> There was a lot of no's on not supporting a lot of that. At CCAG, it was budget conversations and the express lane openings shortly. Um, and we had the pre-hospital emergency medical um, JPA. Uh, Clay can probably talk about that. So Madison, do you want to talk about public art? And then Clay, do you want to talk about the pre-hospital? Because I wouldn't be there. Yeah, I will talk about public art. Um, basically, we've been reviewing um, public art master plans from other cities. This is an ongoing thing. I kind of already talked about that at a previous meeting. We're also reviewing the RFP for a consultant to help us 
choose an artist and navigate the community outreach process and completion of a piece of art behind the bathrooms at the park. Um, so it's basically we're just having working on the same things we've been working on. Um, so I think that we're going to be moving forward with the RFP and we made a slight revision and um, we are going to try to meet with some of the cities who we really resonated with their um, master plans and then also meet with like their staff and then maybe somebody from their art commission to gain an understanding of how it was working with the consultants that they hired to put their master plan together. Um, so that way we can determine like which consultants we seem to have good feedback and which consultants work we like so we can expressly invite them to apply um, even though it'll obviously be public and anybody can apply to work on a master plan for art for us. Um, but we definitely want to make sure that there are some people that we expressly invite. So that's what we're working on. Uh, Councilmember Davis, did you have any other subcommittee reports? I don't. Okay. I was with Cliff on. Okay. And so um, our city manager, I don't know if she's there. You had asked for a report, Council Member Cunningham, about, you said pre-hospital, was that it? I'm sorry, you're on mute. The pre-hospital emergency medical services group, um, that was about budget, but I think Clay would be best to talk about that because he's involved now. <clears throat> you're on mute. Okay, my apologies. Um, yeah, it's just so it's our annual um, board meeting uh, to um, adopt the budget and uh, allocation plan. Um, and there's um, was some staffing issues that uh, Chief Myers and I are kind of volunteering ourselves to step into for for a while to um, help help the agency out. And um, that was about it. Took an hour and a half to do that, but it was about it. <laughs> okay, thank you. So I had a uh, Peninsula Clean Energy meeting. It was on May 26th. The big marker at that meeting was that it's the fifth anniversary of Peninsula Clean Energy actually providing affordable energy. Um, it's the sixth year of the inception of Peninsula Clean Energy, which was in 2016. And of course, PCE is providing energy to 20 San Mateo cities and towns. Um, one of the other notable items revealed at the meeting is there's a contract PCE has with Wright Solar Park. So it's solar energy, it's near Los Banos. And there's a new agreement being signed with Wright Solar that will expand to battery energy storage on the same site. And this seems to be kind of a trend where a lot of um, solar farms are seeing the, the value in the um, need for renewable energy during those nighttime hours. So they're adding the battery storage. And, and this also, what it may not make sense on the surface, this will mean that a lot of Peninsula Clean Energy's costs go down in terms of power because they're not having to purchase uh, fossil fuel generated power during the nighttime hours. And it also gets closer to, there's a goal for 100% greenhouse gas free in San Mateo County by 2035, which is really ambitious. Um, that would be assuming that the programs PCE has that are helping to um, inform residents how to convert to all electric homes and businesses, and of course, reduce the number of gasoline vehicles. Um, finally, just the board had reviewed PCE's financial health. There's other clean energy companies have gone under and PCE happens to be pretty well managed and the organization is really fiscally sound and 
it's had rapid growth in the past six years and it looks like it's going that direction. So we're definitely in this county, we're setting the, the tone and the model for the rest of the country. It's pretty impressive. So that's my report. Um, city clerk, do we have anyone wishing to speak under oral communications? We have a raised hand, Madam Mayor from Council Member Cunningham. Oh, sorry, Council Member Cunningham. Just real quick, Madam Mayor, uh, right, Solar, how do you spell it? Is it R-I-G-T-H? W-R-I-G-H-T, and it's called, let me give you the name, Wright Solar Park. Thank you, mm -hmm. that's all. All right. Back again, do we have any members of the public to make comments? Um, I would like to, Madam Mayor, if I may, um, just report that we received written communication from Karen Lenz regarding Measure G social media post on, um, that was sent on Saturday, May 28th. Pat Patrick Tainter also, we noted that he sent um, a correspondence this afternoon regarding item G. Um, for oral communications, I see no raised hands and I have received no text messages or written communication. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for joining us tonight. This meeting is adjourned at 8.43 p.m. Have a good weekend.